This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. We're gonna be leading our friends through the garden to go see some sculptures. We're gonna get to the spot that they get to see these amazing sculptures, but we want them to get the best view. So today we're gonna be taking a look at Topiary, where we're trying to get our visitors to get the best view of these awesome sculptures. It is a two to four player, very light abstracted game from Renegade Game Studios. Takes 20 to 30 minutes to play. Let me show you how it's played. I'll see you on the other side. Each player is going to take a set of visitors, which have different types of meeples and colors. The goal of the game is to get the most points, and you gather those points by having your visitors look through straight sight lines and look at different sculptures of ascending values, because each of these are going to be worth face value if you see them all. And you'll also be getting bonuses for the same types of sculptures in those sight lines. On your turn, first you must position one of your visitors, which is mandatory, into a sight line. A sight line can either be in a horizontal manner at the end of a row, in a vertical manner at the bottom or top of a column, or in a diagonal manner at the diagonal end of any tile. Now these diagonals can also be in the middle like this. This can also be a diagonal for this way. With the only rule saying that you cannot place one if there's already a visitor there of any type, yours or anybody else's. So if it was the yellow player's turn, they could not go here because there's already a visitor there. Once they've placed that visitor, optionally, they can rearrange sculptures, which means in the sight line that they just placed their visitor in, they can take any face down tile and put it in their hand. They can replace that face up with any tile from their hand, which could be the one they just picked up, but it doesn't have to be. So they replaced that with a five, for example. So at the end, once the visitors have all been placed, it might look something like this, with some visitors going diagonally in different spots, some going down sight lines of rows, some going up and down in columns, and you may have a different amount of tiles face up and face down depending on what choices players made throughout the game. To score, you look at each visitor individually, and you look down their specific sight line. For example, if we were scoring this visitor, we would look down this straight row here. Each of these that they can see, they will get the face value points for them. But in order for it to be seen, everyone closer to that, between that and the visitor, has to be a lower value. Another way to say this is, as the visitor looks down, they're only going to see things that are in ascending order. So it sees this because it's the first one. It sees this because four is greater than one. It's taller. Think of the number being the height. Now this one does not count because it's the same height as this, which means they wouldn't be able to see this one because this is blocking it. Likewise, this one is smaller than something in front of it from this sight line, so you would not get points for that. The five is the tallest, and so they would be able to see that because it ta it's taller than all of the ones in front of it from this sight line. So in this case, we would score one, four, and five for a total of 10 for that sight line. At this point, you use the scoreboard to track everybody's points. In addition to the face value points of the visible sculptures, you also get bonuses. If you can see more than one of a single type that's visible, this was seen, this was not seen because it was blocked from here, and this was seen. So in this case, there's two of them. If you have at least two, you get one point for each of those. In this case, we would get two more points. But let's say these two tiles were actually swapped. So we saw this one, this one, and this one. The face value points would be the same because these were the same values, but now we can actually see three visible ones of this same type. So we would have gotten three bonus points instead of two. And again, you always do that for only visible ones of the same type. And if you have at least two of those, you get one point for each of them. Next, each player can score the tiles in their hand. You'll have three tiles left and you'll be able to score points on this if any of your visitors saw a sculpture of the same type that was larger anywhere in the garden. So if this was for the red player, we'd look to see if they saw anything larger than the dinosaur. The numbers only go up to five. There is the five dinosaur and no red visitor saw it. If they did, they would get this face value points, but because they didn't, this would get flipped over like this. The next one is the two of this bush here. And we look here and we see something larger with the red. And so yes, this will get face value of two points. Here, this visitor also sees something larger of the same type, five, so they'll get this three points. So total the tiles on hand got this red player, five more points. You do this for each player. 
There's an advanced drafting variant that reduces the luck of the game. During setup, once all players have gotten their three tiles, the player that's last in turn order, which is the player to the right of the start player, will get any of the leftover tiles. From all of these tiles, they'll select three of them to keep and pass the rest of them to the player to their right, which is going in reverse turn order. This will continue until the start player is the last one to pick. Any tiles left over at that point gets removed and placed in the box so that everyone still starts with three tiles. Well, let me start off by saying this is a very cool and unique theme. Fantastic. I mean, what have you ever heard of a game about topiaries and sculptures? It's like Edward Scissorhands the game. It's like really cool. Uh, the inclusiveness of the meeples. Uh, I need to touch on this because inclusiveness has been a very big conversation in the board game world over the last couple years and rightfully so i think it's good for it to, to keep inclusion going and, and pushing it further and renegade never is is uh, misses the boat in details they're always very detail driven there's lots of things in their games that you look at and you go wow this this must have taken a lot of thought and a lot of awareness uh, to do these things and this is one of them because one of the meeples here is a wheelchair meeple and after talking to them about this further when i when i first heard about this and saw them they put so much research into not only just what, who, who could we use for inclusiveness in meeples, but also talking to people that are in wheelchairs to say, well, which one of these would you, rec like, would you prefer? And it's not just a person sitting in a wheelchair, it's a person sort of moving or racing in a wheelchair to show that people in wheelchairs aren't necessarily just stagnant, that they, you know, so there's a lot of thought put into that. And anytime somebody puts that much thought and effort into something like this, it really gets a thumbs up for me. Now this game basically is an abstract game. But it doesn't look like an abstract game. You could pull this game out and everyone's going, oh, this looks so cool. You know, for people that don't typically play hobby games, this is a great one to bring out because it's simple. The person my next one is it's easy to teach. Uh, I mean, it's very simple. You can teach this game in five minutes or less. Uh, and it's a great gateway game because people won't feel like they're playing an abstracted game, even though yet it is abstracted. And I typically don't love abstract games, but more and more I'm finding if there's a good, uh, interesting theme and some great artwork, and cleverness, um, I don't mind it. In fact, I found myself liking these types of abstract games and this is no different. Uh, I like, uh, in this game, you're trying to figure out the best way to get your viewers to see the sculptures, but at the same time, you're really trying to cut others off. And, and someone puts their person there and you're trying to stick a tile in there that will get them much less points than they're getting typically. But you're also trying to set yourself up for the future. So you'll set your person up to see now, but then you can set someone else up in a different row that intersects with that row so that you can then change the ones in that row. So even though it's a very simple game, it's very light, you're literally like putting a, 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 a visitor down and then maybe if you want to pull a tile up and replace, that's it. But there is a decent amount of depth based upon that simple premise. You know, like I was just mentioning, coming at a certain, if you want one worker to get a ton of points, you could be going at it at different intersections from different workers, changing those to get one person to get the total of, I think, 15 points, the most one can get, but still trying to get points from the other one. So there is some depth here that uncovers itself after a few plays. I, I like the bonuses for the same types of sculptures. You know, hey, I got three dinosaurs in this row. That's an extra three points. So that's, again, one more layer of thing to think about. Again, this is not a deep game. This is very light. But with that being said, there's still a decent amount of things to think about. Uh, and that's why I think this game shines, because... Uh, it's easy enough to play with people that don't play hobby games, yet it has just enough there for people that, that, that are serious gamers to like this as one of the filler games that they could go to. Anything that I didn't like about the game? No, but just for you, for a con to, be, to, to, to know about, is that this is, as I mentioned, a casual game, but it can be very cutthroat, and it can be too cutthroat for some. Uh, now, this game could be played nicely if you, like, try to. If I play this with my wife, I'll try to purposely not mess her over. I'll just try to do my thing and she'll do her thing. It'll be fine. But for the most part, even sometimes uh, when you're not meaning to, you'll end up, you know, uh, cutting someone off or stopping them from getting points. So, And if you're really trying to do it, this game can be very mean. I mean, this is this can be really cutthroat, messing with people, messing people over. So... If you're looking for a game that's nice, that everyone's gonna play nice, this might not be the game for you because it can be quite mean. Again, you can try to circumvent this. I have played this nice with my wife and it can be played that way if you're both trying to do it and not hurting each other on purpose, but the game's really meant to be played viciously and cutting each other off. And so it might be too vicious for some, but overall, I really love this game. And for all these reasons, it is getting a saxophone serenade and an induction to my gaming library. So here we go.
This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com.